my uh, is uh, more along the lines of live tours and presentations, but I'm very used to getting up uh, and speaking in front of people other than collections manager. I'm also involved with the uh, Panhandle Archaeological Society at Tallahassee, which I think maybe some of our participants today are also members. So welcome, I'm happy you could join us. Uh, so the Bureau of Archaeological Research is part of the Florida Department of State. Um, some of you may have seen Josh Goodwin's, Goodman's, sorry, we have a Josh Goodwin who's an archaeologist with BAR, uh, but Josh Goodman with archives. We're in a different division than them. We're in the historical resources division. Let's see, get my next slide up. Um, so we are located on the grounds of Mission San Luis. If you all are familiar, there's the big visitor center and then there's another building next to that. It was originally built to house the collections of the mission. Um, due to space constraints, we've gradually pushed them out over the years and uh, their collection is still on the grounds of the mission but in a different building. Uh, so our artifacts come from all over the state uh, we only accept artifacts from the state of Florida, and we are not a museum. We are a curational facility. However, well, we'll show, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, I guess, but um, we have over 3 million objects that, uh, that we manage. Uh, here you can see, uh, let's see, let me point on my pointer. My highlight, no, well, anyway, you can see the bottles, which is one of my favorites. Every bottle tells a story, I always say. Uh, that's my supervisor with the blonde hair standing up and my coworker, Jeremy, uh, con get conducting an audit. We do those every year. Um, so we are guided by Florida Statutes 267, um, which covers historical resources and everything our division does, as well as 872, which covers unmarked human burials. We also have a conservation lab, which is located in the RA Gray building. And Sam, my supervisor, supervises both us in this building and that conservation lab. Uh, this is Jessica, our conservator. She has a master's degree in conservation from Texas A&M University. Um, she oversees both our wet labs and our dry labs. So on the top, you can see one of our very large wet tanks. Um, also, the other photo shows a dry, the dry lab, and you can see on the table there's a canoe. So we get everything from cannons and anchors and canoes down to little tiny pieces of pottery. And in the uh, conservation lab, they treat uh, metal, wood, ceramic, glass objects, um, a, a number of things, but not paper. That is one of the things that, um, that we don't have the expertise to handle. Okay, so I said I was gonna get back to this in just a moment, but this map shows you the distribution of artifacts that we have on loan. So we're, we're a curation facility, but we have a very active loan program. And like a lot of other curation facilities that simply store artifacts, um, our goal is to get them out where people can see them. The uh, picture on the top is the Tampa Bay History Center. They've recently um, installed a wonderful new exhibit uh, that is, they've just done a great job of showing uh, the whole story, which is kind of what I'm gonna try to do today, the whole story of um, the Spanish quote unquote treasure ships. Uh, and the one below is right here in your own backyard, the Museum of Florida History, in, uh, which is also in the Gray Building. They're, sister institution, they are now in the same division as us. And um, so I manage the loans for the archeological objects that they have on an exhibit there, not just uh, Spanish plate fleet artifacts, but also all kinds of artifacts. And I just wanted to show you uh, a couple of photos of uh, secretaries of state. We are under the secretary of state. Uh, the first photo is former Secretary Ken Detzner with the King of Spain. This is during the 500th anniversary of, uh, of Ponce de Leon's landing in Florida. So the 500th anniversary of uh, you know, the founding of St. Augustine and all that. And current Secretary of State Laura Lee uh, holding a plastic snowman 
which yes, if it's over 50 years old, it's considered an artifact and it depends on the site, but for some reason this was deemed uh, worthy of, of curating. Okay, so now I'm gonna concentrate on just one aspect of the artifacts in the state's collection. And I say beyond the treasure, these ship, because we all know about the, the treasure aboard these ships. And we're gonna, we're gonna get to see some cool photos later on, but uh, these shipwrecks offer glimpses into what life was like in the 18th century Spanish colonies of the Americas. Okay. So for over, oh dear, my animation isn't working. Oh, sorry. I had this really cute animation of these little ships going along their little path and for some reason it's not showing. But anyway, this map shows you the path. So there are, there are two things going on. Uh, this is the West Indies fleet. Um, so they're coming from Spain over to the New World and gathering up all the goods of the New World and then heading back to Spain again. And then on the, the other side of the map, there's the uh, Manila galleons, which were going through Asia and then to the Philippines and then on to uh, the, the coast uh, to Acapulco. And uh, so they're taking all of their goods by mule train from Acapulco to Veracruz, loading them on these, uh, these ships. So we have two fleets. We have the, uh, the flotas and the tierra fermes. And they went, you can see the little uh, dots of the paths that they take. And uh, they're going to different parts of the Americas, picking up um, different types of uh, commodities and taking them back. Uh, so this lasted for well over 200 years, beginning around the 1530s. Um, oops, sorry. And, uh, by the time we get to the time period that we're talking about, um, it's starting to peter out a little bit and we'll talk more about that. So I talked about some of these goods that they were uh, getting from the new world. Uh, it's hard to tell, but this, the top photo there on the left is a very large puddle of iron ore. And what they were doing is they were melt, smelting these things right on the beach. Uh, and loading them into the ships as ballast to take back where they were further processed. Uh, also indigo, um, quinine bark, um, and also it's hard to tell again from that photo, but those are just dozens of uncut emeralds. But the real reason the Spanish were here was for gold and silver. And there was, there was some gold. We have the state curates, uh, I believe over 4,000 gold coins from these plate fleets um, and the silver. There was a lot of silver. We have over 22,000 coins. Um, and this isn't including these, the, the ingots that you see in those photos. So the gold, when it is under the water, when they, uh, when they bring it up, it looks pretty much like it, like it would now. However, the silver oxidized. And so again, you can't really tell from, I don't have a scale in there, but uh, on the left, that is a very large coin clump, which is estimated to contain about a thousand coins based on weight. And that clump weighs about 60 pounds. On the right is a an actual coin chest. Um, so they would have taken basically four of these bags would fit into one of those chests. And um, so this believed, I believe came up in the 1960s. So in the 1960s, the state of Florida enters into these contracts with treasure solvers to go out and start bringing stuff up from, from these fleets. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about the, these uh, particular fleets that I'm uh, talking about. In the 1960s, this starts, and we still have these um, divisions today. So the state gets 20% of whatever the treasure solvers bring up. And so over the course of 50 plus years, we've amassed uh, a pretty good 
um, assortment of artifacts. So our story with the fleets that, that we have representation for, um, or the, the bulk of the material, I should say, starts uh, with the War of Spanish Succession, which begins in 1701 and ends in 1714. So King Charles II was the last of the Habsburg rulers. Uh, he was um, believed, scholars believe, uh, inbred. If you're familiar with the, the Habsburg chin, he uh, had a lot of uh, physical deformities and, and mental deformity. Well, uh, you know, he, he wasn't what you would consider as being fit to be a king. He dies childless. And this leads to the war of Spanish, the, sorry, Spanish succession. Let me move this out of my way. So, uh, so what happens is they go into a battle over who's going to succeed the Habsburgs or the House of Bourbon, uh, the French. So the French wind up it, uh, putting a king in place. I, I'm not a historian, so bear with me, but um, so which upsets the balance of power if if it goes to the back to the Habsburgs, it winds up going to the Bourbons. And all this ends in uh, between 1713 to 1715, the Utrecht uh, peace treaties are all signed. And so it's finally back to business for, the, uh, for these treasure fleets. They haven't sailed in quite a while. Oh, okay. So I have a, just to, to give you an idea of what these flotillas look like. Uh, again, I was talking about these two different fleets. Each fleet is, can, consists of multiple ships. And um, both of our fleets uh, were completely lost. And uh, they consisted of between 11 and 15 ships each. Uh, you can see that, uh, so these are all sailing ships, of course, uh, at this time period. And these ships are just cram packed, loaded, full of all these commodities that we talked about because they haven't sailed in years. The Spanish are desperate to get the coinage and the bullion back from these ships because they have overextended themselves. Over the last 200 years, they've overextended themselves by trying to expand their empire and relying on these shipments from the new world to fill their coffers. Okay, sorry, I have a lot of lag from the time I click. So our first story is 1715, convoy of 11 vessels and one French warship is guiding them. So you have, uh, you have a couple of really big ships uh, that are very heavily guarded. They have most of the, the gold and silver on them. Um, there we go, that's good. Uh, so, they are struck by this massive hurricane and close to a thousand of the 2,500 people aboard all these different ships that are part of this fleet perish. Uh, and so the debris is scattered for 50 miles along Florida's coast. If anybody's heard of the Treasure Coast, this is where the name comes from, from these uh, treasure fleets that are uh, sunk in this hurricane in 1715. Uh, they employ Ais Indians um, to go out and try and salvage what's on board. And because of, of, with their help, it was very treacherous, dangerous work. A lot of them died doing this, but they were able to recover 80% uh, of what was on board, um, which was pretty remarkable for the time. And um, so it, it's, but th this whole time, they're just constantly bombarded by pirates and privateers who get wind that this has happened and they're coming and raiding. So they're, the Spanish are trying to stockpile everything they can get off of these ships and these privateers and pirates are coming in and raiding their holds. And so it's back to the drawing board, but they still manage to get a sizable amount uh, of the material off. Um, <clears throat> there are various, Marie, Go ahead. Yes. Marie, what, in, what Indians did you say help them? The what I Indian tribe? I Could you spell it? A-I-S. 
Oh, okay. So, I never so heard of them. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's uh, anybody in that part of of the state will will be familiar. Just like we're familiar with the Appalachian Indians that yeah. were around here uh, during this this era. Uh, around there, it was the Aes. And okay, um, thank you. Of course, you're welcome. Yeah, and please don't. I don't mind being interrupted. So if you have questions, feel free. Uh, so one of these survivor camps that turns into the salvage camp as well uh, is now home to the McClarty Treasure Museum at Sebastian Inlet State Park. So if you're ever down there, <clears throat> excuse me, they're actually in the process of remodeling right now. They have a lot of our artifacts on loan that are on exhibit for you to see. Okay, so the next disaster hits in 1733. This time it happens um, down in the Florida Keys. Uh, and it's, uh, okay, th so this one's 22 vessels. I misremembered, uh, it's more than I remembered, but, um, oh, and four ships do manage to get back to Havana. So yeah, so they're, they're starting out in Cuba. The, the two plate fleets reconvene in Cuba and they go up the Florida Straits and to catch the uh, the Gulf Stream back to uh, back to Spain, and so these guys didn't even make it out of the Keys uh, before their uh, disaster hits, and there's still significant loss of life, though not as many as there were on the other fleet. And um, I I didn't have it mentioned here, but the uh, uh, recovery efforts for these ships was much higher. It was even higher than that 80%. In fact, they recovered more than what was on the ship's manifest uh, in these wrecks, uh, which is an indication of contraband, which was a huge problem all throughout the, the time period that we're talking about here. Uh, there was a lot of contraband going on. People were hiding things because they were uh, the, the crown was charging very high taxes on all of this. Um, and one thing I didn't mention is that these fleets are, are uh, have these, the, the royal ships that are full of all the, the gold and silver, but they're also all of these merchant ships. And they're paying these high taxes for the safety that comes with uh, sailing with these fleets. Uh, because again, I mentioned the privateers and the piracy and all that. Uh, so they have to pay all these taxes and to get around it, they're, they're hiding things, contraband. Uh, and so here you can see um, at the time period, the map on the left was actually made by the Spanish. Um, so they know where all these wrecks are shortly after this happens. And uh, so these wrecks are, are strewn for 80 miles uh, across the, um, the Florida Keys. And this is a, a, a modern map that's from, I believe from one of our uh, pages of our website. And you can actually dive on these wrecks. Um, there's, there's not much left, uh, very little left of any of these ships. Um, but it's, you know, there are uh, some things down there that you can see when you're diving. Okay, so now we know a little bit about the background of why these ships were sailing, um, but let's take a look at some of the objects that have been recovered that the state has uh, in our collection. So first of all, navigational tools. Uh, the top left is a spyglass, so it's very important to be able to see uh, oncoming ships that you know are not, that don't carry the Spanish flag. You want to know how many people are on board uh, and you know, how many guns a ship has and all that kind of thing. So, so that is, and what's remarkable about that object is it's wooden. You can see it's got like a little bit of a crushed lens on one end, uh, but it's wood. So some of the preservation from this material is just really incredible. Um, a helmsman slate. So they're using that to aid in navigation the, those numbers are actually etched in slate, and we believe that they used pencils for, so those are kind of permanent numbers that they're using, and then um, they would pencil in other marks that could be erased. The object below that is a sounding weight, and those were used to determine um, depth. 
So they would put wax and a little sand at the bottom of it and lower it down. And they could tell uh, when, when they hit bottom by the, the sand being on that, um, on that sticking to that wax and by how deep the, uh, the rope was. And uh, nav navigational dividers, also known as a compass. We have quite a few of these uh, and there are various styles of those in the state's collection. And this is the part where, you know, where I'm, I'm showing you these and you can jump in with questions. So if you have any questions about them, feel free. Uh, I also wanna point out that the artifacts that, that I'm gonna be showing you in this presentation, um, many of these are actually out on loans. And uh, there's a fair number of them. I know the Helmsman Slate is part of that exhibit now down at Tampa Bay History Center. It's fairly recent. So, uh, and anytime we send an object out, we uh, photo document it. So we have all these images of all the objects that we manage, um, but they're kind of spread out all over the state. So there's a lot of stuff in here that you will get to see that you wouldn't see if you came to our facility. Now, there's a lot more here, obviously, than I'm showing you uh, in this PowerPoint, but um, so it's kind of cool that you'll get to see things that uh, all brought together in one, one grouping that you wouldn't normally Marie? see. Yes. yes. What do those numbers on the slate represent? Now that I, you know, I, I don't know. It's, I would imagine it's got something to do with latitude and longitude or perhaps, you know, speed, I, that's a great question. And uh, we would need somebody who knows a lot more about um, 18th century navigation than I do, uh, but okay. that's a very good question. And it, it, it's possible Maria, that, uh, go ahead. I, if I didn't mean to interrupt, I just thought uh, if you're finished, I had a question about the, the spyglass. I, I'm just, what do you attribute the fact that it's so well preserved and it's been down there that long. I mean, right, a piece that's of a, wood that's a, and still. Mm. That's a great question. So okay. the the preservation for this and, and uh, any kind of submerged artifact that we have uh, that's wood or even bone is because it was buried in an anaerobic environment. So it is buried under so much sand that no oxygen can get to it to deteriorate it. Uh, uh, so, okay. so that's why Thank we have you. that. And, and you'll see as we go yeah. through that some things are much better preserved than others for that very mm -hmm. reason. And um, the tools that the salvers are using are not, uh, not how they would be excavated if they were done by professional archeologists. They're using these giant blowers to blow the sediment away. Uh -huh. So we lose, uh, anybody who knows about archaeology knows that horizontal provenience is very important and context and what artifacts are found with what. Well, we know the time period. Yeah. We know everything aboard these ships either came from 1715 or 1733, but we don't know still how they were in relation to one another. Like, was this Helmsman slate actually found in the part of the ship where they're, they're um, doing all the navigation or was it uh, just being transported? We, we don't really know. All that information, unfortunately, is lost and it continues to be. Um, yeah, it really is. But, but, but the state really wouldn't have the resources to, to excavate all of those ships anyway would, without the private. Well, I, I, I will say that uh, we issue permits for academic research, okay? So uh, universities uh, apply for permits. Um, the Lighthouse okay. Archaeological Maritime Program associated with the St. Augustine Lighthouse, they have a great program where they're doing some great work out there. Uh, if you have a chance to go out and visit that museum, I highly recommend it. They work under permits. Okay. They have their own conservation lab there. And eventually that material will come to us when, when they find a shipwreck, um, one that they recently had on exhibit that they, they swapped out for another exhibit that they recently installed uh, was a, an English ship from, uh, from when England um, controlled Florida, that brief 20 year period of history. And uh, mm. so we know where things were in relation to other things and it tells a better story. So, I mean, we do the best we can, the stories that we tell with the artifacts um, 
that we have, yeah. but a, a lot of information is lost, unfortunately. Yeah, I think that's the most frustrating thing I hear about archaeology in Florida is, is that you just have so little control over it, you know, you know? For that, well, and, the, and for that, yeah. Yeah, and I, I will say, I might not have mentioned this earlier, and I'm glad you brought up that point, that um, that we deal with state managed terrestrial and submerged lands. So we have no jurisdiction over things that happen at city or county parks or private yeah. land for that matter. We can help individuals identify artifacts, um, but we, we have no ownership of that. Uh, but submerged lands are another story. And, uh, and off the, the East Coast, um, jurisdiction is three miles. And I, doing research for this, I, I learned, I always knew that it was different on the West Coast and I always wondered why. Well, if you recall, if you know your history, uh, when Spain uh, had to relinquish uh, the, the most of uh, Florida, um, they still maintained the, the very Western portion of the panhandle and apparently the, the West Coast as well, the waters there, because on the West Coast, the state of Florida waters go out three Spanish leagues. And uh, so whatever that whatever that translates into, I don't remember now, but I always remember, well, three miles on the east, but I never remember what it is on the west, well, because it was Spanish leagues and not nautical miles. Um, I see. Anyway. Henry, thank you. Sure, of course. Okay, so some more of the uh, things you would associate with ship, uh, lots and lots of metal, which again is, pretty incredible considering that this stuff is, you know, submerged underwater. But another thing besides the anaerobic environment, which, uh, which helps, you know, preserve those wooden objects, like you see uh, this olive, the olive branch uh, carved into a, a plank of wood. It's actually much large, uh, longer than the, uh, well, a little bit longer than you can see from that photo there. But we believe that was probably from a, a, a decoration on a merchant ship. But, um, so a lot of the artifacts are coming up as these encrustations that you see on the top there. So that that pulley block is the same. It's the same artifact. And so in the conservation lab, they're removing all that encrustation. And sometimes there'll be an artifact inside. And I'll show you another photo later on where the artifact is completely disintegrated, but that concretion has left a perfect mold behind of the artifact. And um, they would make uh, casts of these artifacts. So we'd still be able to see what they look like, even though the artifact disintegrated. So this cargo hook with the Pringle on it did not come out of the water looking like that. It came out uh, in one of these encrustations and they were fortunate that there was still something inside. Um, I know LAMP uh, does x-rays, uh, the Lighthouse Archaeological Maritime Program at St. Augustine, they, they have access to x-rays and um, I believe that we've probably done some of that in the past, but we do not have our own X-ray machine. Uh, but anyway, so every piece of this metal, every part of these ships that are sailing back and forth every year, they're sending these fleets at least one time back and forth for a round trip. Uh, everything's made by hand. Everything is created by a blacksmith, all the hardware for these ships. So it's, it's really kind of humbling to think um, of how much work went into this. And another thing that's interesting is uh, at least one of the ships uh, had recently been purchased from the English. And when they bought these ships from another nation, they would often leave uh, the munitions on board. So we have uh, British made guns from one of these Spanish fleet wrecks, which is really interesting. And it wasn't from trade, it was because they have records that these were on board the ship when it was purchased. Uh, has anybody seen this cannon? It's right outside City Hall. So the next time you're at, you know, Adams Street up in there, look for this cannon. It sat on the floor of the conservation lab for years before we finally found a venue for it because this thing is huge. And so if you have a chance, take a look at it. So what's uh, really fascinating to me is 
you think about these massive cannons that are on board these ships, because again, I talked about the, the severe threat from piracy and, and all that. And um, so these things were incredibly difficult to load. So this is a muzzle loader. So they're having to load everything into that muzzle and it's like multiple layers of, of shot and uh, wadding and gunpowder and all this. And uh, so it was uh, quite an ordeal just to load it. And they're on carriages, on wooden carriages. So they have to pull it out to load it, right? And then they have to push it through the, uh, I can't remember the, the term that's used, but there's a specific term for the, the porthole that the, the cannons go through. Um, to fire them. So then they're in these really dark, dank parts of the ship firing these things. And can you just imagine how hot it is? They're sailing these things in the summer months. So it's incredibly hot, humid. And then you blow these cannons off and you have all that smoke and everything from that. I just, I can't imagine how awful that must have been. And one of the things that I read was they're using like 10 and 12 year old boys to transport the uh, the gunpowder for them to load these things. Uh, let's see if I have any other notes about this. Okay, so and you you may have seen cannons and anchors traveling around the state a lot, and you might have noticed that they're not in as good a shape as this one. Now this one obviously was a little rough. It has a lot of rust. You can see it's got a very pockmarked surface, but it's in relatively good shape. A lot of the anchors and cannons that are out there, and you have to remember the state is allowed to select 20%, uh, but the other 80% of whatever they bring up, they can sell and do whatever they want. And so they're more interested in the, you know, the things that bring them a lot of money, not in rusty cannons and anchors. So you'll see a lot of these uh, on display all across the state. And uh, we actually have a program, one of our underwater archeologists, we have an underwater program and a terrestrial program in my bureau, um, is recording all of these anchors all across the state. So we have a database because they're being lost because they're deteriorating. They haven't been through conservation. Um, so it, it's a huge concern. So I was talking about them loading the cannons. Well, they had all different types of propellants that they were putting inside these cannons. Uh, some of them were anti-personnel, that canister shot in the middle. So it's a canister that uh, has a burlap bag that's loaded with grape shot or musket balls and they're crammed in there. You shoot it out of the cannon and it just sprays everywhere. Um, now, all of these devices that they used, uh, all these, propellants that are coming out of here are um, need to be used at close range. They don't have the technology at this point to be firing from far away. They have to get up close. Uh, and so what's happening is they're getting up close and they're firing these different types of weapons off. Now I mentioned the canister shots, anti-personnel. The other ones were designed, uh, the one on the top left actually opens up and spins around. And what they're trying to do is uh, disable the ship. They're trying to uh, break the masts, uh, damage the sails, because they want to board the ship and try and take it over. Um, they don't want to sink the ship because ships are very valuable. So uh, that's what's, what's going on here. Uh, let's see if I have anything else. Yeah. And this is another, another type of firearm. Uh, this is a swivel gun, actually. And this particular one is made of bronze. Uh, it was, uh, we know from, you can see the, the close up of, uh, that's actually a date scratched on there, etched into there. And it's 96 for 1696. And um, somebody who is very interested in this and has traced these Cannons uh, has told us that it was cast in Seville, Spain, in the year 1696. And he even knows the name of the father and son who oversaw the foundry. Um, so it, it's really incredible. There's so much information that these artifacts hold. And people know that we, uh, that we have these objects and that they haven't been 
dispersed, you know, the other 80%, I said, are just dispersed and who knows where they are. The state has this 20% that is made available to researchers. Uh, so we're always really happy to find out because uh, we're, we're not experts on everything. I know more about glass bottles than I do about the artifacts I'm talking about today. Um, but fortunately, there are other people who, who share their research with us, which we're very grateful for. This particular canon uh, was brought up a few years ago, and uh, I talked about contraband earlier. There were a bunch of gold coins hidden inside the muzzle of this. So we know they were not using this um, for shooting things off, obviously, because that would not have been good. They would have, if, or if they did, they would have lost all those gold coins. And again, all the different types of things that they need to protect uh, themselves. I don't know if I mentioned this, but when they're shooting these cannons and disabling these ships, they're actually boarding each other's ships to try and take it over. So they're, we're dealing in hand-to-hand -hand combat. This, uh, it's, it's hard to tell from the photo, this is actually a pistol and not a rifle. Uh, at this time period, we're talking about flintlocks. So um, they actually had a little piece of flint in there. We have uh, several flints from these shipwrecks as well. And the different parts, it's, it's really amazing that we have uh, the preservation that we do with some of these. Um, we also have concretions where the artifact uh, disintegrated and left a mold that we have molds of these uh, flintlock mechanisms. And uh, I mentioned earlier that sometimes they leave impressions and you can see, um, does anybody wanna, you can tell what these are, I assume. Can you, if I showed you the other side, you wouldn't be able to tell what it was. It would look like a rock. But in the conservation lab decades ago, they cut this thing in half and you can see the perfect impression of the sword handle left behind. And these are two, actually two different swords. And the one on the right uh, looks real, but it's actually uh, a high sol cast. It's a type of uh, plastic that they use to pour into that perfect mold and, um, and then cut it away. Uh, so we have that really cool object that otherwise would have looked like the one on the right, just remnants of it. So we have the other swords that were made of iron and that's why they disintegrated. Um, and these, you know, silver will deteriorate over time, but not as quickly as iron. Iron is very quick to give up uh, in salt water, as I'm sure you're all aware. Uh, but these are referred to as small swords, which were used by um, naval officers uh, and more, you know, wealthier people. So these are smaller, more like, pre you know, um, not presentation, but more like ornament, but still functional. They still would have had very sharp blades on them. Um, the one on, I, I think that, that other one is brass and it still has a part of the wooden handle attached to it. The other one is obviously silver and that's on exhibit at the Museum of Florida History. Okay, so. Mar yes, Marie, please. before you go on, yes. um, go back to that other, because uh, it looks to me like a gecko, a Florida anole right around the bottom of it. Okay, the one on the, let's see if I can. Yeah, uh, on the left. See how it, isn't it the uh, anole's head? Right here, right, right before, yeah, right there, yeah, yeah. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing that probably a serpent. This, yeah, probably like a serpent or something like that. Um, okay. And All these, right. the the objects that you're seeing, a lot of these are made are being made in the Americas. Um, mm. where they're, where, you know, cause it's here that they're mining, right? They came over, the Spanish came over here. They sent these ex early explorers over here to find gold and silver. They knew that mm. the Aztecs had gold and silver. And, um, so it, it, at one point in Peru, they had over 5,000 mining leases to different, wow. to various companies. It was really an incredible, over the course wow. of the 200 plus years that the Spanish uh, were running these convoy ships, well over a billion, 
probably billions of dollars um, worth of gold and silver are going back and forth. Um, it's really, it's just staggering to think of really? the volume of material. And they're, they're using um, probably very, very, very low paid workers and also slave labor to go down into these, uh, these really dangerous mines. I mean, people died all the time climbing into these mines to bring the ore up one little leather bag at a time. And, um, and they're, so they're processing that here with mercury at this time period during, during all this time, they're using mercury. So it's just extremely hazardous. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yes, was there something else? Okay, all right. Uh, okay, you're welcome, no problem. So Spanish olive jars. Archaeologists call them olive jars. These are these have been around for centuries, long before these plate, le plate fleets even started. Oh, I don't know. I mentioned it was in one of the slides that when I when we we call them plate fleets, um, others refer to them as the treasure fleets. We call them plate fleets. Plata is Spanish for silver, um, so we refer to them as the plate fleets. Uh, so anyway, they were transporting all sorts of stuff in these olive jars, uh, olive oil, olives, wine, honey, lots of other commodities are being transported. These, these large ones, um, let's see, I'm gonna get my pointer. What did I do with my, I lost my pointer. Anyway, uh, let's see, my, uh, the, the large long ones um, are stacked on their sides and they have corks in them keeping the contents in. The, the smaller squat ones supposedly had water in them. So you have to think the journey back to Spain takes two months. So everything that all the, you know, everything that they're gonna eat and everything they're gonna drink has to be on board that ship. Uh, and it's not just sailors that are on board these ships. There's also, uh, you know, military personnel. There's also just um, passengers, uh, people that are, you know, they're trying to get people to establish themselves in the colonies. And so these people are kind of going back and forth with their families. There's all kinds of people aboard these ships. Um, and food spoilage was a, a really big problem. I think I talk about that a little bit more later on. Um, but anyway, so- um, the I have one, a question. Yeah. Um, uh, there's no scale on here. Do you have any idea how I big? No, I'm sorry. Yeah, to, to try and fit them all in there. Uh, on some of them, I took the scale out. So the one on the left is going to be, I don't know, can you all see me? I have my, <laughs> I got three screens going here. I was telling Maureen, you know, about pretty big. Some of them were pretty big. Can you tell from my hands what I'm talking, you know, about yeah. how big Yes, they are? I can tell. Yeah, yeah I can tell. Size yeah. And the, wa the water ones are only about yay big. They're, they're much more squat than the other ones. Um, and these, the design of these changed over time. So uh, although this particular style was used for hundreds of years, so it's not terribly diagnostic, but we, obviously we know what time period it's from because it's from, you know, we know when this fleet went down. Uh, but the, the ones on the left, you can't, it's kind of hard to tell because they look different colors in the photographs, but they're from the same vessel. Uh, and it's highly, highly unusual that it would be decorated at all because these are purely utilitarian. So does anybody recognize that when I talked about the, the Habsburg, Habsburg, however you want to pronounce it, uh, that's the Habsburg Eagle. Okay, hmm. so this is from the 1733 plate fleet wreck. So 33 years after Charles II dies, we still have the Habsburg hmm. symbol there, which is to me really fascinating. Recycle. Like what, what were they putting in those vessels, you know, and still using them? So uh, that's, that's really kind of cool. Or what, had it been over here? For a really long time and they were just sending it back it, you know we'll never know but there is also uh yeah there's a few parts to this and part of it is actually on exhibit down at the florida keys uh history and discovery center and parts of it are here as well earthenwares so you've all heard of um majolica 
tin enamelware, Delftware. Yeah. Delftware is the same thing, okay? It's all made about the same time period. The Dutch and the English are making the Delft. Uh, you know, the Italians are making their Mayalicas and the Spanish are no exception. And most of what we're finding uh, on also on the Florida mission sites, I haven't really touched at all on the, the Florida missions, but um, they're getting all of this Majolica from uh, most of us made Mexico City, actually, and they're putting it on these ships to send back to Spain. And it, it was very elaborately decorated archaeologists. I, I tried to be able to distinguish them. There are so many different kinds of majolica that uh, archaeologists based on the color of the paste that it was made out of, the texture of the paste, and uh, as well as the colors that they used in the decorations and the motifs that they used. And they used a lot of animal uh, motifs. And there's just a, a, a jug, um, you know, similar clay that they were using to make the olive jars that you saw on the previous slide. That one has a, a lead green glaze on on it. Okay, so I, I briefly, yeah. Marie, uh, yeah. So just as a, a side thing, uh, if that if that's the word in Spanish, right? The Majolica? Yeah, but that J is pronounced like, like an H. No, I'm, I'm anglicizing it. It would be yeah. Majolica. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I briefly mentioned the, uh, the Manila galleons. These ships have quite a bit of this blue and white Chinese porcelain. And this is some of the finest made porcelain being made in, it's probably the, the, the best made in the world. The English are trying to imitate it. Even with the, the, uh, those majolicas that I showed you, the blue and the white, they're trying to imitate these Chinese porcelains because these are really well made. These are not, as today, right? They're your good dishes. They're not your everyday dishes. This stuff was expensive and there was a lot of it coming through. Um, and so we have a fair amount of it. And this particular one, the larger one on the right was a large, it's a large ginger jar. I do have a scale on that, but it's kind of hard to tell if you come for the tour. Uh, it Well, hopefully it'll still be here and hasn't gone out on loan, but it is here and it's been here a while. It's a very large piece. So it was probably found, uh, it's hard to say, probably in the 70s. I'd have to go back and look at division records. It, was, it wasn't accessioned until the 1990s when we um, created our database, but um, about three years ago, we were going our, doing our division, which I said we do every year. And I noticed something that the pattern on it seemed familiar. Let's see if I can get my pointer to work here for you. We have the piece that fits right here that came up decades later, fits right in here. Um, so eventually, and actually we do have other pieces I realized as well, which is kind of cool. Okay, so the tools of the 18th century tailor, uh, sailor, sorry. So there's, there's constant work to be done on board these ships. Uh, a lot of the stuff we just looked at is in, in all the holds, okay? It's, uh, but, but up on deck, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, sailor's palm, you can see the, the, the little uh, protrusions on it. It was uh, sewn into the palm of a glove and it was used for mending sails. Uh, the uh, broad axe was used to turn round uh, timber into lumber. So it's, they're using that to, uh, which they're not doing on board ship. That was probably something that was a commodity that was being sent back to Spain. But, but the other one on the left bottom, uh, the um, boarding axe, uh, those are really important. I mentioned the hand to hand. Marie, combat. let's go. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Does someone have a question? Yes. Uh, the sailmaker's palm, is that kind of their version of a thimble? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. So, so you can imagine, though, that uh, that sewing the sails is going to be really <laughs> heavy duty stuff, not like when we're doing embroidery or something like that. So they needed 
really heavy duty to be able to push those needles through those sales. So that's what's going on there. Um, okay. uh -huh. Thank you. Of course. And um, so anyway, the boarding acts uh, is really important for uh, clearing the deck because when, when all these things are going on and they're being shot at, we have rigging that's dropping all over the deck and the decks are getting really cluttered. And so they're using this to chop that. They're also using them. Um, they're actually kind of similar to fire axes today to break through to areas of the ship that might be on fire. And also you can see that um, that the, the, uh, the right hand side of it is very pointy. And so you can imagine that would also serve as a pretty effective weapon uh, when you're dealing with hand in hand combat. The one on the bottom right is a caulking chisel. So they're constantly maintaining leaks on these ships is just a constant and they're constantly having to repair. So this was used with a wooden mallet, which we also have a couple examples of actually in the collection, uh, which survived. And they are you know, using these to hammer that caulk in between the boards. So ships maintenance. I mentioned um, all the people that are on board these ships have to be fed. Now, I, I kind of feel like maybe, based on what I'm reading, what their rat rations were, uh, it was very meager. Uh, the, the one on the top left is a pasta roller. I have a hard time believing that when they're on sailing on the ocean, they're actually making pasta. I'm kind of thinking that that was a, a trade item or you know, to, to be sold back in, uh, back in Spain. The same with the pastry wheel. That's on exhibit at the Museum of Florida History. I mean, how cool is that? It kind of looks sort of like a pastry wheel now, right? Technology hasn't changed that much. Uh, bottom left is a uh, sartin. Yes. Is there any indication that these galleons heading back to Spain traveled in fleets? Yes, absolutely. That's, that's what we, uh, I didn't, explain myself well enough, that's what they're doing. So the 1715 fleet was 11 ships sailing all together for protection and 1733 was 22. They're definitely sailing together because of that constant threat of, sorry, I'm looking at the screen with, the, with um, dealing with the pirates and the privateers. So traveling safety in numbers, right? And they had, they're sailing in the company of these very heavily armed uh, vessels and paying the crown for the privilege to be able to sail with them. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah. So they sail together coming and also oh, returning? Yes, yes because okay. they're bringing things to the colonies from Spain as well. Now it's, okay. I'm sure not as heavily, you're not as concerned on the journey there because they don't have the, the gold and the silver. Um, that they're taking back. I'm sure it's much, much more elaborate. But yes, they are flying or uh, sailing together. Now, when they're coming over, they're two separate fleets. And then they're joining up. After they've come over, they separate and they go on their different journeys, which my little, I'm so disappointed. I spent so much time on my little boats and they didn't do their little sailing thing to show the route. But, but then they convene in Havana and all sail together as one unit back, back to Spain. Uh, so anyway, these are just some examples. Uh, copper frying pan. We actually have some really big pots too, some uh, copper pots that are really cool. And, and a couple of things that are identified as a pancake cooker and um, the lid for a pancake cooker. Very large. They're making very large pancakes in these pancake cookers. But, um, I'm not sure how, how somebody determined it was a pancake cooker. Marie, what, what kind of food, uh, you, you were starting to talk about what kind of food they would have? Yeah, so not a lot of fresh food, okay? So they're eating uh, salted meats, salted fish, um, tack, wine and water, olive oil. All these things are given out, like rationed over the trip to the sailors. Now, I don't know if there were other, you know, the other passengers on board, what they were eating, um, but also they were carrying livestock on board these ships. And so they would occasionally slaughter a pig or 
whatever animal it was uh, and feed those throughout. And as you know, during this time period when these fleets are sailing, uh, scurvy is a big problem because they don't have fresh fruits because these things are um, spoiling very quickly, right? And there's constant threat of uh, spoilage uh, of um, contamination from rats and mice are all over this stuff and, and defecating and urinating all over it. So, you know, trying to keep this stuff uh, away from uh, the animals and from weevils or getting into the bread. I mean, I just can't imagine how incredibly miserable it must have been aboard these ships. So they weren't, you know, it's you think of all the glamour of the gold and the silver, but the reality is on board these ships, it's pretty miserable. Um, another thing that we have a, a couple examples of in the collection are is uh, cocoa pots and the cocoa stirrers or frothers. So when the Spanish first come over, uh, the natives of Central and South America have, uh, are taking advantage of the uh, cacao, which we know now, cocoa, chocolate, what we make chocolate out of. Uh, then it's this very, very bitter drink, but the Span Spanish quickly learned to put sugar in it and it just explodes in popularity. It's really popular. And you can see in this, um, this painting that I found uh, an example of what one would have looked like, um, you know, when it was new. And do you notice, uh, I don't know if you noticed when I was showing the Chinese porcelain, the, um, the cup. So we think a lot of the cups that we have, they don't have handles on them. So they're not necessarily, we do not necessarily teacups. We think they were use, using them for cocoa. Another thing that these folks are uh, getting in Mexico and taking back to Spain that, um, that they learned how to use these from the Native Americans that were there, the, the indigenous peoples, are uh, manos and matates in Spanish, so uh, mortar and pestle. So this is an example of um, somebody grinding cacao. They obviously were also using them for corn. Um, so the, the Spanish weren't doing this until they started colonizing the Americas. We think of when we think of, you know, Spanish food and, and corn and tortillas and all that, that's not until they come to the Americas and start bringing this stuff back over to Spain. And then we'll get into some of the, some of the cooler stuff, I guess some people might think, although it's all pretty cool to me. Um, silver. There's a lot of silver, and it's not just coins and ingots. Um, it's also they're also making things out of them. So we have skilled artisans in Mexico. Also, they're they're um, the the Spanish didn't have a whole lot, but they had a lot of money to spend. So they're buying the, 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 all this wealth that they're bringing back to Spain is getting spread all throughout Europe because they're buying lots of stuff with this money that they have. So it's kind of benefiting everybody. Um, so some of the, the, uh, the silver that we have is actually made by uh, British silversmiths. And um, you can see on there, the, those markings are markings of um, the silversmith. There's also markings on silver uh, of the assayer, the, the tax assessor is putting their mark on it to make sure that a uh, tax was assessed on that so the king is getting his cut. Um, the, the piece in the middle, I don't have a scale on, it's fairly small, it's a utensil handle. Um, but uh, my, my first supervisor who since retired like to call that uh, the Carmen Miranda utensil, right? If you all remember those Carmen Miranda movies where she had the fruit all stacked on top of her head, it's kind of what's going on in that one. And again, I was talking about the concretion. So this is an example of a concretion down here on the, the bottom right. You can see the fork protruding out. Can you all see that? And there's probably other artifacts in there as well, but a lot of people think the clumps are really cool just in and of themselves. So we do have several clumps that we have kept intact uh, just for that purpose. Okay, Catholicism is extremely important 
you, you're aware of the, the Spanish missions uh, from Florida all the way to California, where they're converting the native peoples to Catholicism. Uh, so we certainly see evidence of that aboard these ships. Um, so we have uh, rosaries, uh, aspergillum, which was used uh, for sprinkling holy water, altar bells. We have a few of those. This one is engraved. Um, S.A. Yosef, so St. Joseph. And it's kind of hard to tell from that photo if you're at the Museum of Florida History you can check out uh, one of the exhibit cases where this is, but it's a, it's a little tiny crash with a baby Jesus inside and the piece of glass is laid over it. A few years ago, um, if any of you recall, they redid the plaza area of the Gray Building. The Gray Building was built in the early 1970s. <clears throat> and uh, so it's showing its age and they had to redo the plaza area and it resulted in all these um, leaks in the Museum of Florida History because they didn't think when they built the, that building specifically for actually the archeological collections, that's where we started out when I started working for the state in 2005 and we've been relocated twice since then. But that building was built for the archeological collections. It was built for the library and archives and it was built for the Museum of Florida History. But they put the museum underground. So when they started jackhammering on the plaza, they started having leaks. And so we actually removed everything out of that. If you seen the, um, the plate fleet exhibit at the museum. Uh, we took just about everything out and were able to get some really good photographs of this stuff because it had been installed in the seventies and it's hard to take pictures through Plexi. Um, so we were fortunate that that happened. It's not good for the museum, but it was good for us. So we got some really good photographs and that's what you're gonna see uh, in the next few slides are some of the really, really cool objects that are in these cases um, at the Museum of Florida History. They're, they've all been relocated now, so you can see these objects. Uh, the one on the top right is probably a um, shoe buckle. We talked about the sailor's palm uh, being a thimble. Here's some more thimbles. So these are made out of silver. Uh, this is a sectioned box, probably a snuff box, and a, an angel-shaped finial. and some of the, the gold objects. Uh, rings, we have quite a few rings uh, from these fleets, uh, mostly, mostly 1715. Um, there's not, not a lot of um, silver or gold that came out of those 1733 ones, because as I mentioned, they, they recovered a great, great deal of it. Uh, the, uh, the folding knife is really interesting that it looks like a fish and it's actually a little knife that is pro it was probably used as was the scimitar uh, on the chain uh, for cleaning fingernails and one of one of my favorite objects not because it's gold but just because of what it is is this manicure set on the bottom right and if you it's hard to tell from the photo but you can see one of them uh, so it's going to be let's see if I get my my pointer to work bear with me Again, not, not super good at the, uh, right here, this object right here is an earwax spoon. I mean, who couldn't use an earwax spoon made out of solid gold, am I right? Pretty crazy. So that was my question. These are solid gold, they're 20. These are solid gold. Because gold is so soft. It's surprising that they, they it, it's, it's really funny. Um, because the, the registrar at the Museum of Florida History tells me that uh, they get questions all the time asking if they're fake because it's so pure. It looks like, like that can't be, it can't be real gold, but it is, this is solid gold. And uh, I'll talk, uh, the last slide, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so these are just more, another thimble, uh, solid gold, of course, who doesn't want a solid gold thimble, cufflinks, another probable shoe buckle, or not necessarily shoe buckle, it could have been another kind of shoe buckle, uh, just gold chain. Um, this is one that's quite long actually, and we have a lot of little fragments. This one was, was quite long, and another pair of gold cufflinks. And this, this is one of the more impressive artifacts. This also is at the Museum of Florida History. It's had a couple of different okay. interpretations. How big How is it? Big. This, yeah, this is about this big. 
pretty decent size for being solid gold. This is the best, you have to bear with me. Um, I was using photos we already had, and this one didn't have a photo with a, we didn't have a good photo of it with a scale. Um, but it's probably about eight inches across, I would say. A little bit less width-wise. It was originally interpreted as a glove tray. Um, pretty elaborate. This you know, had to have been destined for the king or the queen, we're thinking. Um, we had, when they, when they opened up the Forever Changed exhibit, if you've been in the Museum of Florida History in the last 10 years or so, they've added that exhibit. They brought somebody from a museum in Spain to preview it. And he looked at this and he said it was a cocoa tray. I talked earlier about how popular and important cocoa was to the Spanish. <clears throat> so it seemed plausible. And so the museum changed their interpretation to that. But the gentleman who found this, this was actually an isolated find. He found it all by itself. Um, I, I couldn't say exactly if it was on the beach or whatever, uh, but he found this. And it's definitely associated with the 1715 fleet. And he argues that it is in fact a, a glove tray. And he, he did a lot of research on it and, and it is possible. We don't know. These things don't come with little tags that tell us exactly what they were used for. <laughs> so we just make our best educated guesses. Well, that's the fun but, search you get out though, what, what the answer is. Isn't it? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Say again. I said, that, I said that's the fun searching out what the answers possibly could be. It's one you of the favorite parts though. of my job. It's one of my favorite yeah. parts of my job. Getting uh, it's finding the time. I showed you earlier the the two gentlemen in the photograph early on. So it's the two of them and myself. We manage three million artifacts, just the three of us. So so we don't always have a lot of time to to put a lot of research um, as much as we would like into these things. Um, now let's see, now watch, I hope this works. It will, there you go. So we are all about preserving and sharing Florida's past. They're, the treasure salvers uh, have this, this age old myth that they, that still perpetuates that we put everything in a vault uh, downtown and lock it up and it's just in bags all over the floor. Couldn't be further from the truth. As I've mentioned, these artifacts are on exhibit to museums all across the state. Uh, we do have a vault where we keep a lot of the, uh, basically all of the precious metals. Every single one is cataloged. Um, we have a database where we manage all this material. We do a 100% audit of everything that's in that vault. In fact, they just completed it yesterday, every year, and, uh, and a, a smaller um, sampling of an audit on the other objects in the collection once a year as well. But you can see uh, this, this picture on the top right is uh, the St. Augustine Pirate Museum, if any of you have ever been there. They have a room that has about three, three or four exhibit cases of artifacts from our collection there. They did a, um, it's a really tasteful exhibit. Uh, it's, you know, it's great for kids if you want to bring your grandkids there, but there's a lot of really interesting information for adults as well. They did a really great job with it. I mentioned, uh, we were talking about, you asked about the solid gold. So down here on the, the bottom left, uh, She's holding a PXRF, a portable X-ray fluorescent machine, which can determine the types of metals in an object, but not only that, but percentages as well. And when, when these very valuable objects go out on exhibit to museums, we require that they are appraised. And it helps the appraiser to know the purity of the metal in it to be able to give a value to it. Um, we as archeologists don't like to value artifacts because everyone to us tells a story and is priceless, but unfortunately, um, you know, they do have a value um, on the, the black market. Um, and so for insurance purposes for these museums, uh, we need to know what their monetary value is. So things like this are very helpful. Uh, we've had numerous uh, masters, theses, 
dissertations and even books that have been written uh, from people researching the state's collection, uh, which one is uh, we had a gentleman come in and study the, uh, the silver coins and the gold coins, and he's published a couple of really great books on those. And there are numerous other publications out there um, about these, uh, these artifacts. The, uh, the Majolica bird that I showed you in the middle, that's on our website. So if you have a piece of paper in front of you, take a note down. Florida History in 3D. It's all one word. Dot com, Florida History in 3, 3 the number 3, Florida History in 3D.com. And we have taken a, some of the objects that you've seen here today and created a website where you can go on. And this is great, great thing again to do with your grandkids. You can take your mouse or if you open it on your on your cell phone or on a tablet, you can take your finger and rotate these objects 360 degrees, flip them around, look at them from every angle. So it gives you an opportunity, even if you can't make it to the museum where they're on exhibit, or if you don't come to collections for a tour that's in September, you'll have, still have an opportunity to see some of these objects and to learn about them. So I highly recommend you check that out. That's one of the ways that we're, we're reaching out um, to the public to, to get these things out where people can learn from them and appreciate them. Oh, it's gonna do it again, look at that. So I'd like to take a moment to, again to thank Maureen and the Tallahassee Senior Center and Foundation. And oh, I forgot, there you go. There's the website right there. So you didn't have to write it down. It's right there for you. Um, also uh, our Florida Heritage website has more information about the plate fleets. Although a lot of that information is also on our Florida History and 3D website. <clears throat> um, the uh, NOAA has created a shipwreck trail down in the Florida Keys, which includes some of these, um, the 1733 wrecks that we were talking about. So that wraps up my presentation. Hopefully I didn't bore you all to sleep. Um, if you have any more questions, I'm happy to answer Marie, them. I yes. do have a question. Um, sure. You're looking at the chain, that really long chain. Yes, uh, I understand that you could cut pieces off to, to pay for things. Because oh no, I had see, I hadn't heard that. Yeah. I hadn't heard that. Now we have uh, there are coins in the collection that um, have have been cut, like cut in half or pieces cut out. But I hadn't heard about the the chain. That's very interesting. I'm gonna have that's to look. Why, at that. Yeah, that's why it was so long, and then people carried parts of it or whatever. So you could actually since there. Are, you know, 24 karat gold, you could pay for things by, you know, cutting And it would be easier to transport than some of these coins. Those coins were pretty heavy. Right. So that's really interesting. Well, thank you for sharing that. Okay. See, I, that's what I love about these things. I learn something every day about the things in our collection. That's wonderful. Thank you. Does anybody else this have any questions? Very, no, I just wanted to thank you, Marie. This was a very oh, informative. Good, but, uh, good. Uh, I'm glad. Thank you. Could you tell us real quick the difference right. between a privateer and a pirate? I, I, other people might know, but I don't know. Yeah, so a privateer is acting on behalf of the government that they represent, right? Wow. So Francis Drake is, is representing the British government when he came and raided the silver camps and stole all that Spanish gold and silver, whereas pirate is... But you would think pirate. And um, what's, what's interesting is uh, if any of you are familiar with uh, Queen Anne's Revenge was Blackbeard's flagship. And uh, they're, they're actually um, working on conserving that up in South Carolina. And they uh, contacted us about a very, very similar artifact, a Krennikin. It's a, it's a type of a jack. And they have one that's almost identical to the one we have, but theirs is in better shape. We also have a gunner's measure, which I don't think I had a photo of it, but it's this brass thing with markings on it. And it's on our website um, that was used for measuring the trajectory of a cannon. <clears throat> Almost identical artifact was found on Queen Anne's Revenge. So is it possible that Blackbeard himself was one of the pirates that came and raided these camps? I mean, if you're Basing it on the types of art, it's possible. It's possible. 
I'm not saying he did, he did but but anyway, does that answer your question about the difference between a private tutor? And yes, a thank you. That's really You're interesting. Well, thank you so much. There's a lot of compliments on the chat and I will be sending everybody the recording of this um, in case you want to watch it again uh, or for the people that missed it today. So uh, any other questions before we sign off? Uh, you were talking about um, a tour, Marie. Yes, Maureen has arranged a tour. It's going to be for L3X in September. Oh, great. Yeah. yeah. So keep keep up, uh, you know, watching for that. We'll be releasing all that information in early August to sign up. Okay. And now I'm warning you, when you come in, you'll see some really cool stuff. And um, I think you'll be impressed, but you're not going to see any gold or silver because we don't keep that here. <laughs> That's uh that's under lock in and special key, way way more special than we have here or on exhibit. And a lot of a lot of museums have uh, have those artifacts on exhibit that you can visit. So anyway, I really have enjoyed this, and uh, I look forward to seeing some or all of you, because I can only see just a couple of you um, on my screen. But uh, I hope that that you can come for a tour. We'd love to have you. Thank you so much, Marie. This was wonderful, really interesting. And thanks everybody for uh, participating in our program today. If you want to uh, look at our upcoming classes, go to TallahasseeSeniorFoundation.org. Everybody have a good rest of your day. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, Bye Thank everybody. You. Thank you. My pleasure.